Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today, I'm thrilled to have as my guest, uh, Ria Wong. Ria is the founder of Ria Wong Consulting. She's also a host of her own podcast, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today called The Nonprofit Lowdown, and has tremendous experience as an executive running a not-for-profit here in New York, although it's a national organization. So welcome to The Caring Economy, Ria Wong. Toby, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Ria, we always like to ask our guests uh, about their career journeys and about their pivots in particular. Um, we all know that um, all the successful people we've had on this show didn't get where they got by themselves, right? They relied on many who've come before them, many who've mentored them. So tell us a little bit about your own personal journey, where you're born, how you were raised, uh, your education, and then more importantly, the sort of career journey that you've made and, and some of the, quite frankly, the knocks you may have had along the way and the pivots you made to, to uh, go from there. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, gosh. Um, so I was born and raised in San Francisco uh, in a you know middle class family. My parents are both uh, children of immigrants. And so I think, you know, very much raised with the kind of the immigrant mentality of like work hard, <laughs> don't make a lot of noise, put your head down. Um, ended up actually going to college in Montreal, which is a funny choice for a Californian. And I thought I was actually on a path to journalism. So this is the early 2000s. And I ended up after college working at Mother Jones Magazine, which is a pretty lefty magazine for those of the folks out there who are familiar. Um, you know, and I think really for me, journalism was about telling the voice or telling the stories of people who didn't have access and didn't have a voice. Um, so I've always been pretty sort of social equity, social justice minded. Mm -hmm. But again, early 2000s, and I was like, this internet thing seems like it's not going to go away. <laughs> I saw the writing on the wall. So I decided to make my fortune in nonprofit. <laughs> um, <laughs> <I knew. laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Questionable choices. But, um, you know, I think I realized early on that money was not the motivator for me. Uh, I And that, you know, I, I think I was lucky enough to get clarity pretty early on in my life that what I really cared about was helping other people to maximize their potential. And so I became an executive director at the age of 25. Um, and I, I did two uh, internet Google searches my first day on the job. The first, I guess I was 26. So the first was, you know, what does an executive director do? <laughs> And the second was, how do you fundraise? Mm -hmm. So over the course of 12 and a half years, I built up the organization from when I started, it was about $250,000 per year up to uh, when I left, it was just a little bit under $3 million in private funds. Uh, and so- And this was you know, Breakthrough, right? This is Breakthrough New York. And uh, we're, we're a college access program serving uh, high, high achieving, low income kids. And, you know, I- I was really proud of what I built, but I was also like, why did it take me so long to figure that out? So I started consulting sort of by accident. There was a very short stint at a, um, a tech company, and I realized that that wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, and I started consulting by accident. I would say I you know, kind of took on a couple of projects because people in my network heard that I had some free time and one project led to the next. And before I knew it, I was uh, <laughs> a fundraising consultant. And, and particularly in uh, once COVID hit, my, my business started to boom. Lots of people wanted to talk about fundraising. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm specifically focused on smaller nonprofits because I feel like those are the ones that get uh, the fewest amount of resources but have the greatest need for expertise. Mm -hmm. So, so many places to go with that. Uh, first, uh, kudos to you for Mother Jones because... <laughs> it's still know, around, by the way. Yes, it is, and it should be. I mean, it is the granddaddy, the grandmother, really, of, of, a, of a movement. So um, I can imagine how appealing it was for you. But to also have made it in there is huge, right? Because a lot of progressive young people always wanted to work there. So kudos to Did you. Did they? I, well, it wasn't glamorous. I was I was the fact checker. It was a little cave. Uh, we weren't paid very much, but the the perk we got was that we got free books. <laughs> so. yeah, well, but but you did it. That's my point. And and then that not being motivated by money, but more sort of elevating others, purposeful uh, sort of uh, career choice. I, I that resonates with me. That's that's really the main driver for the caring economy. 
I wonder if you spoke a little bit about the tech consulting stint. Um, <laughs> tech gets a rap for better, for worse of being soulless. I've opined quite a bit about it, um, particularly in your back, your, your former backyard, San Francisco and, and Silicon Valley. Um, was it that sort of soullessness that didn't uh, hold you there? Or was it something else that said, mm, not? Well, <laughs> I have an NDA, so I can't say much about it. But um, let's just say that I was not values aligned with the company. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, because I do believe in technology. I just think sometimes the way it's deployed or the motives of those. Yeah, I, I was. The, I mean, I think the other thing is, too, there, there's a lot to be said for believing in the leadership and believing in their values and what they want to achieve in the world. And when you don't find yourself aligned, I, you know, it was incredibly demotivating for me because it wasn't like the money was keeping me there. Like I, I'm a big, I'm a big cause person. Like my, my husband rolls his eyes every time I come home, I'm like, I've got this new cause I care about. I care deeply about causes. I care deeply about being engaged on a, on a values level. And, and so you know, to me, going to work for the money wasn't enough. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm the same. I, I, I think of it as purpose and higher purpose, not just cause mm -hmm. or purpose, but is it a higher purpose than just my own my own needs and interests? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm definitely there with you. And um, the role of leadership is absolutely critical. I've written about it in The Caring Economy. I think that anything we do around corporate social responsibility, around social impact, <clears throat> more your area, is meaningful, is helpful, is additive. But if you really want to catalyze a change from the leadership down That's and right. grassroots up, you have to have all folks aligned and saying, yes, this matters. It matters to me yep. personally. It matters professionally. So I'm That's glad right. you're nodding in agreement. So talk a little bit about leadership and some of the great leaders perhaps that you've worked with, Rhea. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we have Rhea Wong with us today. She is the founder of Rhea Wong Consulting, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about her podcast shortly. So tell us a little bit about leadership from your perspective, please. Oh, gosh, I'm just trying to think about all of the great leaders that I've been blessed to work alongside and with. And, and now I, I have a number of clients who I consider to be great leaders. I mean, I think the nature of great leadership is, um, you know, <laughs> truth and hope. You know, I think the really, truly great leaders are the ones that can be truthful and can tell you the hard truth, but also paint a vision of hope and what the world could be if we all kind of gather together and stand shoulder to shoulder. Um, I think in my younger days, I was, uh, I, you know, I think I, I had my own insecurities. I was 26 years old. What did I know about anything, right? And I thought that the way to be a leader was to, you know, tell people what to do and like never let them see you sweat. And I think as I got older and, and more secure in my own leadership, I was able to be a better leader because I could be more authentic and more open and, and you know, say when I was wrong and say when I didn't know and more always be in, in a kind of learning stance. Um, so, you know, I, I think the best leaders are the ones that are constantly – growing, um, being aware of who they are and their impact on the world and how it's landing with others and always being willing to be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with that. And I also think that that's what makes us human and makes us uh, as an organization stronger. If we have that diversity of perspectives and, and the human piece, then everyone gets to move along together versus someone being uh, successful at the expense of others. Yeah. And I would say, you know, as I think about it, Toby, like I you know, certainly am not 26 years old anymore, but I, I had to do a lot of growing up. And I think what I see in a lot of dysfunctional organizations are leaders that have not sort of healed their own wounds mm -hmm. and sort of inflict mm -hmm. <laughs> their own psychological baggage on their staff and their team. And, and I just, I feel like, you know, call it mental health, call it wellness, call it healing. But I just think in order to be a really effective leader, you, you have to heal yourself first. Yeah. And, and I, I think that businesses have gotten better at having those conversations and having the transparency it allows for that. Mm -hmm. We still have room to go, certainly. Um, I, I, I've seen so many workarounds in my career where there is that leader who is not necessarily um, as evolved as one would mm -hmm. hope for such a position of authority. And so 
people find ways around that to, you know, not poke the bear, so to speak, but Mm -hmm. it's less and less so the case, I think. Um, I wonder in that same vein, Rhea, if you if if you think that Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement, if they've helped in a sense um, bring to the surface um, bad leadership and thereby improve the state of leadership across organizations. <laughs> so you're, you're asking the small questions, Toby. Um, <laughs> you know. I, I certainly think it's it's helped to surface conversations that we know that we've been having forever. I mean, let's just talk about, you know, I, I've spent my entire career in nonprofit and I led organizations that worked predominantly with um, African-American and black and Latinx youth. So like all these conversations around, you know, police brutality and, you know, targeting young black men, none of this is new, right? Like we've known this forever and ever. Um, And then, you know, with respect to me too, like I I talk about this all the time. I, I, at some point will do a podcast about sexual harassment and fundraising. And when I first started fundraising, uh, a seasoned fundraiser said to me, you, (laughs) when you go in and ask, you have to show some cleavage or some leg, not both because that's slutty, but it has to be one of the two. Wow. Um, I don't know a single fundraiser who hasn't had some kind of uncomfortable situation or, or some sort of sexual harassment. So look, do I think it's brought these issues to the forefront? Sure. Do I think that people are behaving better? Probably, if only because they're afraid of being called out. Mm-hmm. Do I think that like we fundamentally changed as a society? Nope. Yeah. So do you do you have some, um, shall I say, solutions is the wrong word, but do you have some examples of where some organizations have perhaps successfully or more successfully than others started to do that? that harder work to affect that kind of change? I mean, I mean you know, Toby, I, I know you're predominantly talking about the corporate sector. I'm, I've never worked in corporate, so I, I couldn't really say. I, I see some glimmers of hope. I mean, I, you know, I have a dear friend of mine who runs an organization that does diversity, equity, and inclusion training for corporations. She's busier now than she has ever been. Um, she's on the West Coast, so she's employed by, you know, big tech companies. And so I think even having the kinds of conversations they're having seems to be moving in the right direction. Uh, but again, to your earlier point, I think for real change to happen, it has to be bottom up, top down, and that there has to be a real realignment of the way that we do business. Mm-hmm. If we actually say, if we're going to do business and care about the things we say that we care about. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, I think a big part of it, and it actually goes back to our question about leadership is I think if we are to meet this moment in the way that we ought to, it's going to take leaders who have a tremendous amount of humility to understand like, you know, some of the past wrongs that they've done. And in in some cases to really step aside and Mm -hmm. let others lead because at the end of the day, really what Black Lives Matter and racial equity and all of that means is it's about giving you know, making the room for other people Mm -hmm. to step up into leadership and to have opportunities. And that means, you know, in a, in a world where there's only one CEO, Mm -hmm. that means like you might have to step aside and you might have to risk your own status and your own paycheck. Absolutely. Uh, Again, ladies and gentlemen, today we have Rhea Wong with us today. She's the founder of Rhea Wong Consultants and the host of Nonprofit Lowdown. Um, Stick with us after this break. We'll be right back. So Rhea, on that whole point of sharing power, really, or position, I couldn't agree more. The thing that runs through my mind at my age is when is the right time for someone to say, I've had my, my go at it and it's time to pass the baton. I, I think that we're living through this moment real time where, where, um, where say the predominant white male executive is now either ready for that moment or thinking about it, but not necessarily there yet. And I wonder out loud, is 
is it too early to ever start thinking about who, like I tell my young team members, I want you to have my job one day. Like mm-hmm. I'm very clear about that. I want them to replace me, mm-hmm. but I don't know if others do that or if it's prudent to do that. But I do wonder out loud if there's a, is a tenure question, like an executive of a certain level should be in his or her role, perhaps for four years max or mm-hmm. five, just like we have terms for elected officials, because I don't see how we're going to get the momentum of change that we need across at least the private sector, but I think even in the not-for-profit sector, unless we rotate people in more regularly than we have. Does that sound cogent at all? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I sort of have two responses to that. My first response is yesterday. I think we needed people to move out and make room yesterday. And then I'm also of the mind that we have to do it carefully. So I, I don't think it's any good to put folks of color in positions of power if the structure around them is not um, is not welcoming to them. If we yeah. haven't fundamentally shifted the model of white supremacy uh, and corporate culture, right? And so I, I do think as white leaders are thinking about their next steps and and lifting up and supporting leaders of color in their organizations, they also really need to be thinking about structural changes that have to occur within the ecosystem in order to make leaders of color ultimately successful in the position. And so, you know, I've seen certainly in the nonprofit sector, like, oh, we're going to hire a, a BIPOC person and and we're not going to change anything fundamentally about the organization. We're not going to change our funding base. We're not going to change our board, our predominantly white board. We're not going to change any of the practices that are rooted in white supremacist culture. We're just going to change the person who is sitting at the top. And guess what? When that person is not successful, we don't make it about the structure. We make it about that person. Yeah, absolutely. I can see why you're such a great consultant, Rita, because at the end of the day, I don't even think that the boards necessarily think we're not doing this, we're only doing that. I don't think they think about the systemic questions. They just think about, oh, we'll, we'll hire a BIPOC person and then we mm-hmm. check that box. Yep. And then too often those people are set up to fail. So mm-hmm. I guess in your consulting, I presume that you talk about the systemic holistic approach to change and, and development as opposed to just doing DE&I recruiting. Well, I will tell you, I'm, I don't really consider myself an expert in DEI. I mean, I certainly do touch on a lot of these topics because I think y- you, you just have to touch on these topics. So I really uh, focus primarily on, on fundraising as my area of expertise. But look, it, it's so connected to organizational change management, right? So if you're thinking about, for example, diversifying your fundraising base, well, let's talk about who's sitting at your board table. Like if you're trying to... To, you know, access communities of color to diversify your base, and like you should be looking at your leadership and whose network you're tapping. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there are also structural things that folks who are doing DI work should really be thinking about, such as like how are you recruiting people into your organization? Who are you recruiting? How are you selecting them? How are you retaining them? How are you training and providing uh, ongoing professional development? Who's getting promoted and why? Who's getting paid and and at how and what level and why? Um, and so I just think we we have to be ready to engage in some very deep and uncomfortable conversations about things that we assumed we didn't have to talk about. Like, oh, it's just the way it is. Well, the way it is obviously is not working for a whole bunch of people. Yes, exactly. It's taking us, it's not taking us, taking us where we need to go. So let's talk a little bit about Rio Wong Consulting. So fundraising, so many people would run from that word because they are phobic about money or it's taboo to talk about asking for money. But how did you how did you crack the code, Rear Wong? What's your secret? Oh my gosh. Well, I will tell you, Toby, for a very long time I dreaded fundraising. Um, because I think we have a deep phobia in this country, certainly uh, to, uh, about money, right? It's very it's like, what is it? Money, sex, and politics you don't talk about at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. Um 
And I think a lot of people have, most people have baggage about money. So whether you were raised with a lot of money or raised with not a lot of money, we all have baggage, right? But the funny thing is money is just a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper that we tell a story about. Mm -hmm. And the story can be empowering or it can be disempowering. It can be a story of, you know, stability or it can be a story about scarcity, right? But it wasn't really until I came to the realization that like money is not a thing. I'm making it a thing in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And I tell the story a lot, but I grew up in San Francisco in the 80s and 90s, height of the AIDS epidemic and crack epidemic. And there are, there was then as there are now, you know, lots of folks who are homeless. And I remember giving a quarter to a homeless man on the street and my father got mad at me and he was like, oh, so you're so rich now you can give away money? Wow. And, you know, my my family was very middle class, but in my mind, I was really raised with this scarcity mindset, right? It was, it was always about like, well, we can't afford that. Or what do you think money grows on trees? Or what what do you think we are? The Rockefellers, right? And so like I had absorbed this message about money that there's never enough, that we need to hoard it, that we need to, that, you know, there's scarcity in the world. Mm -hmm. And so why would we, why would we give money away? And it wasn't really until I I kind of dug into my own money story that I started to realize all of the stuff I was putting on fundraising and I was putting on money that had nothing to do with the person I was talking to. It was all in my own mind. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing I I realized is, you know, you can probably tell I'm a fairly um, personable, extroverted person. Mm -hmm. I just realized fundraising is just about making friends. Fundraising is just about relationship building. And once I stopped making the relationship about money and I started making it about the work and I started making it about who who wants to be invited to this party that we're throwing, then it just became fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you also can invite the people in those conversations to reflect on their own views of what value is, right? Mm-hmm. So then you're really operating at that higher purpose, right? You're supporting your organization but you're also catalyzing the change, I believe, in not just raising the dollar ask, but the way people think about your organization, about you, about the values behind the organization. So it's, That's it's right, quite right. an exciting revelation you just shared with us. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I also think the other problem is that a lot of people think that fundraising is about the ask. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we rush to the ask because we think it's about the money. And I think we, you know, I, I use this analogy all the time. It's It's like... When you meet someone and you go to the ask, it's like proposing to someone after the first date. Mm -hmm. You have to create a relationship before you ask someone to marry you. Yes. Well, since you brought up that metaphor, I will say it's a little tacky, but I always tell people I need a little foreplay. Like when so much fundraising (laughs) that I I will always take the ask from someone who's making the ask because I always say, thank you for making the effort of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Whether I write a check or not, that's noble that someone is making the effort to fundraise for an organization that they either care about or support or work for. So, but I tease them along the way and say, you know, I need a little foreplay here. That's right. You got to set the mood. Not- Take me out to a nice dinner, you know, make me feel special, but, but also like make me understand how my purpose and my values align with the work that you're doing. And not everyone is going to be, you know, you're perfect match, right? Like right. there are, I, I think I, I talk to fundraisers all the time and I'm like, this, this work is not about convincing anybody to do anything. This right. work is about aligning values. And when the right person hears the thing that you're doing, their response is going to be like, oh my God, where have you been all my life? Right. And then please don't send me a, a bulk email, right? Like yeah, that don't send me a bulk say email. I care. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, well, so Ria Wong, I want, ladies and gentlemen, again, today we have Ria Wong with us. She is an amazing consultant. Her firm is called Ria Wong, Ria Wong Consulting, and uh, she's got a podcast called The Nonprofit Lowdown. Tell us a little bit about your podcast, which I'm really keen to listen to. I haven't had the chance yet. This oh, week. yeah. Well, Toby, we should have you on the podcast, actually. I love that. Um, so my podcast was, it was started as sort of a, a fun side project. So I'm a big podcast fan. And I, I just thought, well, everyone has a podcast. I should, I should have a podcast. But mostly it was uh, an excuse to hang out with my friends because, you know, here in New York City, everyone's so busy. 
at least we we were a lot busier back then. Um, and, you know, I would see friends that I, I loved, you know, smart, intelligent, energetic, connected people. I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's have coffee. Let's have drinks. Da, da, da. And like it would never happen. Mm-hmm. And so I started this podcast as a way to make myself spend time with my friends because it's like, okay, look, we can put coffee off for weeks and weeks and weeks, but I actually have a publishing schedule. So I'm going to stick a microphone in your face and we're going to talk about all the things. Yeah. And it's really just grown from there. So, I mean, to be honest, I never really thought that I would still have this podcast two and a half years later, but here it is. It's just still going strong. And I think it's, you know, I'm getting really great feedback. I feel like people are really finding it useful and interesting. I'm still finding it interesting. I mean, I, I learn something new from every guest that yeah. I bring on and it's a lot of fun. But tell, tell, us, uh, tell my listeners, please, about some of your guests or the the themes that you explore. Clearly, it's fundraising oriented, but you've got great executive directors, philanthropists, yeah. folks. Yeah, I have a pretty wide range of folks. So I've had you know philanthropists, I've had foundation officers, I've had executive directors, I've had development directors. I mean, generally, it's it's anything that's obviously related to the business of nonprofits. Um, It doesn't have to be fundraising related, but I also have made a big commitment to raise up the voices of BIPOC folks who often are not invited to be on podcasts or to share their perspective. And so um, what I find interesting is I actually have to go out and recruit people to be on my podcast because often... You know, I think BIPOC folks are not seen as experts in their field. And so I, when I reach out, it's always like, wait, me? Are you sure? Like, yes, you. Please come on my webinar. Come on my podcast. Mm. You know, you remind me, uh, Rhea, I just heard a couple of weeks ago through the philanthropy workshop, which you may know, um, this fantastic woman out of Los Angeles, um, Gloria Walton, who you might want to check out her organization she is an African-American woman and she helps guide, if, I, if I'm reflecting this correctly, she helps guide um, philanthropists who want to both do philanthropy, but also do it with a DEI lens. Love um, it. She's kind yeah. of like a clearinghouse or a good housekeeping seal of approval. She's quite a impressive, energetic woman. So uh, I'll share that with you in the spirit of collaboration. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Toby. Um, of course. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, I, uh, today we've, we had as our guest, Aria Wong, who's an amazing, extraordinary consultant in f- uh, fundraising, but also uh, the host of the nonprofit Lowdown. Um, Ria, I want to ask you one last question, and then um, I know we've got to jump. But um, as an Asian American woman, um, mm-hmm. pick any descriptors you want, but what would you want the um, the rest of my audience and me to know about that? about you and all right well let me say this asians are not white people (laughs) which i I feel like it's an obvious thing but i i realize so i grew up in san francisco among all of the asian americans right so like never in a for a moment did i think of myself as a white person and then i moved to new york and at one point um I had a, a young woman leave the organization and in her exit interview, she says something to the effect of, well, well, you know, because this this whole organization is is white led. And I was like, what is she talking about? <laughs> um, so I think what's been interesting for me in uh, this these conversations about racial justice is is trying to center the Asian American experience, because it does feel like such a black and white issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I think historically Asian Asians have been used as a wedge issue. And so we've, we have been what we, what they call the model minority. And it's often held up like predominantly white cultures, like the good minority people. Right. And I think that has both been used as kind of a bludgeon, uh, against other people of color, but has also really, um, well, the curtain over a lot of issues in the Asian American community, right? Yeah, I, like there's a stereotype that, you know, Asian Americans don't procreate as much. They are diligent and mathematically and right. wise, very savvy um, mm-hmm. and not uh, provocative, so to speak. Right. Yeah. These yeah. The, the, the good work, agents, they go to college, they work hard, they you know, do quiet. jobs, yep. they're quiet. Right. And and so I think it's been um, it's been a way to erase 
the experience of Asian Americans and, and used as a, as a weapon against other folks of color. And, and so I would just say that, like, you know, when we look at the Asian Americans, we see a tremendous, I mean, actually, we see huge poverty in the Asian American community. We see um, really disturbing levels of uh, mental health issues, mm-hmm. particularly among young Asian people. And now we're seeing the rise of huge anti-Asian sentiment, right? So I just, I say that all to say that, you know, it's, it's, it's not just black and white, I guess is what I would say, right? Like there's a lot of um, intersectionality and interplay here around like, what does it mean to be a, a, an Asian American person in America and to be very much philosophically aligned with other people of color and then f- and sort of be surprised that other folks of color may not necessarily look at me as a person of color. Mm-hmm. I get it. You know, as a gay man, I, I've been very involved through the years in um, political activism and on boards. And um, once in New York State, we got, quote unquote, got gay marriage. Um, a lot of the funders of one board organization I sat on was... Um, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, well, it's, we're done. You know, I've got yeah. marriage. And then the transgender thing as it came to the fore as it needed to, I believe, and still does. Um, a lot of my colleagues, my pals said, mm, it's not my issue. <laughs> and I thought, mm-hmm. how can you <laughs> care for a human rights organization, but feel like we've all, we've arrived if in fact, not everyone has crossed the finish line with you. So I, yeah. I commend you for both Ria Wong for what you're doing in your, in your personal and your professional life, but also thinking holistically about, you know, about the human aspect of it, the justice piece. Cause I do think we've, we've all just got to double down. That's what I try and do with my podcast is share my platform and um, mm-hmm. you on today has been a great way for my audience to also learn a little bit more about your experience and your work so yeah i appreciate it thank you toby um so ladies and gentlemen today we've had ria wong who is the founder of ria wong consulting if you need any help on your fundraising goals check out her site ria what is your what is your, your social media or your website Oh, it's very easy. RioWong.com. R-H-E-A-W-O-N-G. I don't think there are very many of us, so <laughs> it should be easy to find. All right. And um, and any final thoughts for our audience on the caring economy and uh, reflections on the world ahead of us? No, just um, thank you for doing everything that you're doing. And I think, you know, if, if we're going to get out of this mess, we got to do it together. Amen. Thank you so much, Rio Wong.